Did you know formaldehyde can enter a home through products like engineered wood, furniture, computers, carpeting, treated fabrics, hairsprays, and cleaning materials? These potentially harmful VOCs can circulate through indoor air living spaces and affect the air that your clients breathe. The good news is you can ensure your client's air is clean with certainty air renew drywall. This air renew indoor air quality drywall is the first of its kind patent pending drywall that actively cleans the air by permanently removing formaldehyde. When airborne formaldehyde comes in contact with the board through normal air circulation, air renew drywall captures the formaldehyde and converts it to safe inert compounds, keeping it safely within the drywall. Indoor air performance tests prove that air renew permanently removes formaldehyde. It has been validated by ULE through their environmental claims validation program. It works with most water-based acrylic and epoxy paints and has just recently been recognized or been declared on the Living Future Institute's Declare channel and through health declaration products. Um, bonus, uh, this does contribute to the credit for lead air quality testing for uh, low VOCs after construction. Well, welcome to Building Resilient Communities, Climate Proof Residential Properties. Uh, this course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, AIA, HSW, uh, GBCI, NARI Green, Certified Green Professional, AIBD, and may be applicable to your local or state-based design contractor license. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. All right, well, with that, I am very excited to uh, hand it over to our presenter today, uh, Lori, with um, Enterprise uh, Community Partners. Um, Lori Schumann is a National Program Director um, of Resilience and the nation's leading affordable housing nonprofit intermediary. In this capacity, she oversees Enterprise's efforts to develop climate-resistant communities around the nation, providing technical, programmatic, and policy support to CDCs, states, and cities working to develop resilience in low-income communities. Her focus on multifamily urban housing has enabled Enterprise to become one of the leading voices in affordable housing resilience around the nation. Lori specializes in complicated infrastructure initiatives that showcase climate adaptation, as well as economic and social equity to educate the world and cities and the environment. Prior to joining Enterprise, Lori developed several innovative and catalytic infrastructure products, including uh, San projects rather, including San Francisco's award-winning off-grid Eco Center and New York City's first rooftop urban agriculture STEM education lab, and the first housing integrated urban farm featuring a state of the art uh, hydroponic, 10,000 hydroponic farm. So, with that, uh, Lori, we're real excited to have you here today, and feel free to take it away. Thanks, Brent. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and so, in in uh, as part of my evolution professionally, of course, uh, understanding how to support our communities uh, to be climate resilient is probably one of the most challenging projects I've taken on to date, and certainly will probably uh, take much of the rest of my life to try to figure out how to do this. Uh, but I'm really excited to uh, to be with all you all of you today to talk through um, some basic bread and butter ways of understanding how to support climate resilience for your building projects. Um, I do want to uh, start off by saying that we're focused mainly on multifamily housing and specifically affordable multifamily housing. So um, you can certainly take. Uh, your cues and take uh, the information that we share with you today and apply it to any of the residential projects and commercial projects that you're working on. So today, let's see here, just trying to get to the we're talking about future proofing housing. Um, we're going to be reviewing uh, a couple things. One is how do you understand your climate risks for your particular projects 
using some of the leading risk identification tools out there uh, in the market, but we're going to also focus specifically on one of the tools that we've developed uh, called Building Strategies for Climate Resilience. Um, the bulk of the session will be focused on some of the strategies that we're surfacing in this tool, and then you can use that and apply it to your projects. We're also going to talk about how do you assess and start the assessment of your facility's particular climate uh, and emergency hazards, uh, looking at a variety of the leading uh, extreme weather uh, issues that we're dealing with around the country. We're going to also understand how to identify how to specifically future-proof your particular facility using some of the practices in the manual that we're going to discuss. The practices mainly support mitigation and adaptation, and we can talk about what those terms mean a little bit later. And then ultimately, we know where to go to get more information to build back better and smarter and safer and make sure that your communities are safeguarded uh, in the event of a climate event. Uh, and we have a, on the line right now an audience of over 100 uh, professionals from all over the country. So uh, when we talk about climate impacts, we're talking about flooding, we're talking about tornadoes, we're talking about fire. Uh, it runs the gamut. So I want to first uh, tell you a little bit about Enterprise and what we've been doing, some of the lessons learned uh, over the last decade that we've been working in this space. Um, Enterprise Community Partners, as Brett said, is one of the leading uh, affordable housing developers around the country. Uh, in 2016 alone, we deployed $1.6 billion across the country uh, to communities that were building affordable housing and working to make sure that they are able to uh, keep their affordable housing, protect their affordable housing, and we, we do this by providing grant support and loans, as well as syndication of uh, tax credits. Uh, we have 11 offices around the nation. Uh, I always joke, one in each climate zone, so we are always uh, kept busy. Uh, we also, I'm out of the New York City office, which is our largest office, and we've been around for about 30 years. And, you know, we, we essentially work in three different ways, which we're going to talk about. We work to deploy capital, for sure, uh, to support communities, but we also work in a couple other ways, which what we're talking about today is, is really the way we work to support the technical assistance needs of communities. So just to, just to give you a little context about what this initiative is about and what we're going to talk about today is extreme weather events are becoming, unfortunately, more frequent and more severe. Uh, this is increasing risk to homes and property and infrastructure around the United States, stressing already stressed systems. Since 1980, there have been more than $260 billion spent just in flood damages alone around the nation, with the average event costing taxpayers $5.8 billion. And this is just uh, looking at flooding. Flooding and drought are the leading uh, disaster climate events that the nation is facing, and these are the most uh, expensive events to recover from. So when we talk about building resilience, we have to look at uh, certainly all events that we face, but these are the events that uh, really are, are, are causing a great deal of uh, risk and exposure to so many communities around the country. We know also that low-income communities are on the front lines of this, chain, of this damage and continue to be the most vulnerable, in part because a lot of low-income communities are sited in floodplains and in areas that are less uh, resilient to climate hazards. Uh, we also know that urban areas and cities face extraordinary risk from heat and flooding. Uh, for example, in 1995, the Chicago heat wave led to almost 750 deaths alone uh, often because residents are, are holed up inside their houses, they don't have air conditioning, and it's hard to get to cooling centers. Uh, we also know after Superstorm Sandy, when uh, I came on board Enterprise, that flooding uh, for urban communities it has particular impact because it impacts the uh, multifamily housing in a very specific and technical way, impacting boiler systems and MEP systems, uh, systems under the base flood elevation, which is a term that's used to describe uh, 
where we're at, uh, where, where our flood uh, line is at, at at the building level. And so when disaster strikes, we also know that low-income communities have less access to the resources they need to recover. Uh, Short-term displacement can lead to cascading impacts for a community like homelessness and loss of services. Uh, and many of you that are in communities that have a disproportionate number of low-income communities know that when those services go down, it's very hard to get them uh, to, to get stood back up again in a, in a quick manner. And low-income communities also have a lot less reserve to uh, tap when there's an event. So we believe that investing in the resilience of all of our communities and all of our at-risk communities is a smart and cost-effective way uh, for us to protect our residents in our communities, and that investing in mitigation and investing in resilience saves us uh, the, the funding that comes into place through recovery. Uh, and we also know there's a Building Science Council uh, statistic that for every dollar spent in mitigation yields $4 in savings. So for all these reasons, we're focused on resilience, we're focused on protecting our properties, we're focused on future-proofing our communities. And for enterprise, resilience really is the capacity for households, communities, and regions to adapt to changing conditions and maintain and regain functionality in the face of, our, of these stresses as quickly as possible. I would also go, ahead, go further to say that resilience is also about incorporating the lessons learned from your previous events and experience into the buildings that you're building and the designs that you're putting forward. When we think about incorporating those lessons learned, we're not just thinking about the extreme events like Sandy and Katrina, but I would offer that you should consider the events like the one inch rain event that occurs that could flood your city streets or the small heat wave that occurs that blacks out your community. And so for enterprise, we have three goals in our uh, efforts to promote resilient communities. One, that housing organizations or developers and architects design and operate affordable housing that is sensitive to the community's cultural needs. That two, community stakeholders really are included in the planning of your buildings and your communities uh, and that they're engaged because they're the, they're the eyes on the street. They're the folks that live in the buildings and uh, understand what happens at the buildings every single day and can help you together be a partner to build a resilient community and facility. And then finally, federal, state, and city planning processes are shaped and supported through policies that protect vulnerable communities and promote resilient planning. And so, like I said, there's a couple different ways that we work uh, on, this, on this topic. Uh, and I'm gonna go through a couple different things we're working on, a couple different projects we're working on to give you a sense of the, of the broad, uh, broad view we have on this, on this topic around the country. So we've got lots of uh, place-based projects that we're driving around the country. And just to give you a sense of a couple of them, uh, we are working with the city of New Orleans on their Gentilly project, which is the nation's first resilience district. Uh, this is sponsored by HUD through the National Disaster Resiliency Competition, and we're working closely with the city and community partners to build out a resilience district that incorporates stormwater management and community resilience uh, and, and, and space that allows for perimeter flood proofing. We're also working in New York City to help 100 multifamily housing owners develop resiliency plans. We send auditors into buildings, they conduct resiliency assessments, and then we provide counseling to owners on what they can do to improve the resilience of their facilities. We're also working upstate New York and in Long Island with HUD and the Governor's Office of Stormwater Recovery, uh, of, of Storm Recovery to help public housing that was damaged after Superstorm Sandy recover and rebuild in a resilient manner. So we're deploying $38 million to these public housing authorities to help them create resilience interventions at their facilities. We provide trainings around the country to folks on resilience, to housing owners, to architects, to developers, to cities, 
Uh, some of the cities we provided trainings for recently include Miami and Chicago. We also provide trainings to rural communities. Uh, we've got a couple coming up. And just to give you a sense of our national work, we're working with uh, the AmeriCorps VISTA program, providing 60 VISTAs to 20 tribal communities around the country to help these tribal communities figure out how to build their resilience uh, and to build the resilience of their housing and their community infrastructure. This is a really exciting program. In fact, next week we're going to be in Santa Fe having a convening with our partners in the, in the tribal communities. Uh, we're also working uh, with six cities around the country to help them catalyze, develop, and, catalyze and develop resilient uh, districts around uh, transit-oriented development through the SPARC initiative. Uh, we're working with Memphis and Atlanta and Los Angeles and San Francisco, among many of our grantees. And uh, we're finally partnering with NeighborWorks America to provide support to housing developers around the country to help them figure out how to build resilience plans into their housing. And this is a grant program that we're actually going to be issuing an RFP for the next couple weeks. And so please contact me afterwards, uh, after this seminar, to uh, let me know if you're interested in applying for that. And as I said before, we have 11 market offices around the country, so we work very closely with our markets to identify how can we support their efforts on the ground working to protect and safeguard low-income communities. And so in every market we work in, whether it's Boston or Los Angeles or Atlanta or Portland, we're trying to figure out what the needs are on the ground and try to attend to those needs. And the other ways we work is we also provide support on research and analysis of prescient topics of the day. So we recently worked with some partners in New York City to develop a uh, study on the rising cost of flood insurance and how that impacts multifamily properties. We also look at providing analysis after an event, as we did during Sandy, trying to figure out what the impacts of Sandy, uh, Superstorm Sandy was for many of the communities that we work with. Uh, so we came out with some reports that were useful for policymakers. And we also uh, work closely to try to figure out how to, how to weigh in on some of the key and leading policy concerns of our day. We're working on the National Flood Insurance uh, Program Reauthorization and trying to figure out how to make sure that low-income communities are supported. Uh, we also work closely with the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. And so many of these policies that are promulgated at the state and federal level are important to pay attention to as we think about how to safeguard our communities. And finally, and what we're going to be talking about today, is how we build solutions for communities on the ground through uh, research and analysis and actually developing tools that help communities build smarter and better and more sustainably. So many of you understand, uh, have, are familiar with the Green Communities Criteria, but for those of you that are not, uh, our Green Communities Criteria was developed 10 years ago to help affordable housing developers and designers develop green buildings that are healthy and habitable and, and sustainable. And so we are now uh, proud to say we're the leading green standard for affordable housing. Uh, if you are building affordable housing in upwards of 38 states, you are required to look at the community's criteria for certification. And the green community's criteria is, 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 is an extraordinary uh, framework uh, that allows you to understand how to build your building uh, with particular needs uh, in mind, placement of your building, looking at the health standards of your building and the design of your building. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, research we can provide to you on understanding what that criteria is. But for today, we're going to focus on one specific tool that we developed that really supports the resilient design of your multifamily housing or, or housing facility, and it's called the Strategies for Multifamily Building Resilience. And this was built uh, three years ago. We started off on the path to try to figure out what it means to develop resilient multifamily or residential buildings. After Sandy, we deployed uh, four teams of engineers to 55 multifamily building sites around the region of New York. 
to try to figure out how to help support the quick recovery of these buildings and the long-term flood proofing of these building, uh, these facilities. And we got 55 resiliency reports back and we realized very quickly that a lot of the guidance that we were providing to these owners based on the excellent work that CMAT does really was not relevant for a lot of these building owners. Uh, namely because it's very difficult to raise or rather elevate these building facilities. And we also thought that there could be some opportunities to figure out the specific needs of multifamily buildings. And so we went on a journey to figure out what we could build that would help support the resilience of multifamily or, res or residential buildings. Um, and so what we came up with was the strategies for building resilience. We worked very closely with some key partners uh, at uh, the Resilience Design Institute and uh, Linnaean Solutions and over 50 uh, technical experts that weighed in to this guidance, which we're going to talk about today. Now, first, I want to review some basic concepts. What are we preparing for? When we talk about resilience, we have to first start off with saying to ourselves, what are our risks? What is our greatest exposure? What are we trying to build for? And so the first thing you want to know when you're building your uh, development is what are your primary vulnerabilities? And so I, I'm just going to share with you a couple tools that I like to use uh, for quick, uh, sort of quick overview of what kind of risk we're dealing with. Um, I actually like a tool that was developed by the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. It's a mapping tool that you essentially uh, key in your, your uh, coordinates of your project and it'll tell you what your state pre predominantly faces in terms of your risk. And so, for example, in Arkansas, uh, they have lots of risks, tornadoes and thunderstorms and floods, as well as earthquakes and extreme heat. So it's a big list. So you're going to want to dive down deeper and try to figure out, okay, within my site that I'm building, what are the primary risks? And the first piece of guidance I would have is you want to make sure that you understand the flood risk first and foremost because uh, that is a risk that has some very specific regulatory requirements that you will need to have to comply with as a designer and a builder. And so I like to go over to FEMA in the region two, which is New York, New Jersey, there's a great coastal analysis and mapping tool. I can key in my coordinates and find out exactly what my flood zone is. So the A flood zone is your most vulnerable zone because it's right in the floodplain and you're most exposed to surge, storm surge from the uh, tidal action. You can find out a lot about the terms in our manual, uh, but what you want to know is where is your flood zone? If you're in the high-risk flood zone, you're going to have to think about your mitigation techniques. If you're building new construction, you're going to want to think about your base flood elevation, which is, again, the elevation at which build, water will enter your building. So usually your basements and cellars are underneath the base flood elevation. So if you're building, you're building and you're in the A zone, you want to know where your mechanicals and electrical switch gear are going to go. You're not going to want to put them under the base flood elevation. You're also going to want to know if you have to elevate your building. Um, if you're dealing with a retrofit, you've got a lot of challenges, and this is one of the things, one of the uh, one of the reasons we built the strategies manual to deal with retrofit challenges. Um, so FEMA is going to tell you a lot about your flood zone. Some of you may be in communities where there's no analysis or mapping tool, so there's other tools you can use locally to try to figure out what your, uh, what your exposure is. Everyone has access to your hazard mitigation plan, uh, which is at the county level, uh, which is worth looking at, so you'll have to talk to your local planning agency to get those access to those. Those will tell you what your risks are as well. The other tools I want to talk briefly introduce you to is the NOAA, uh, which is the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has some excellent science tools that you can identify how to understand ways, ways of supporting your uh, building risk and understanding what your risks are. Um, and I would say that you should, should try to look at that site 
uh, as soon as you can to try to figure out what kind of resources you can get and gather. And these resources will include uh, understanding your wind uh, exposure as well as your uh, some seismic exposure and, and other other hazards. And then finally, the National Climate Assessment is the nation's um, repository for an array of climate science tools that you can tap to understand your exposure. And it's going to take you a couple days to get through it. It's a very impressive set of tools. But the National Climate Assessment is an excellent clearinghouse for all the tools you need to understand what your risk is. So first step, when you're designing in a uh, vulnerable zone, understand what you're designing for. And you're going to want to understand essentially what then are your risks. So you're going to want to make a connection between your exposure and your uh, climate, the climate events that you might be planning to protect your facility against. And then you're going to want to understand, okay, then what are the impacts to my facility, my residents, my business or organizational continuity, as well as the community. So I'm going to go back to a chart that will help you understand uh, the questions you might want to ask when you're, when you're thinking about your risks. So essentially, you're going to want to know if there's a tornado that I'm planning to mitigate my facility against. Um, I also want to know what the impact for the residents of that tornado would be. They would need to evacuate, perhaps, or, or are they going to shelter in place? I want to know what the business continuity impacts will be. Uh, is my business prepared to deal with an event like a tornado? Do I have all my server files uploaded to the cloud so I can access them? Do I have all of my phone numbers for vendors that I need to get in touch with? Uh, then you're also going to want to ask yourself, okay, what are the impacts of the building at the building level if there's a tornado. Uh, does that mean that all of my key infrastructure components, my electrical, my resource, my utilities, my gas, my, uh, my water, is that going to be impacted by this extreme wind event? And how do I mitigate? And then finally, what do I need to think about at the community level when I'm planning for a tornado? I might want to think about where are the community shelters? Am I providing a community shelter? What kind of contingencies does the community have in place that I should be considering? For those of you building a social service facility, you're even going to have to ask a broader question, which is, if I have vulnerable residents in my facility, what community resources are out there to support their own resilience and my own peace of mind? So we have lots of case studies of social service organizations having to evacuate uh, residents that were dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. They were veterans, they were dealing with PTSD, and Superstorm Sandy represented a major trauma for them. So what in the community did they have access to to help them support that evacuation? So there's a lot of questions you want to ask yourself when you're doing a risk assessment. We have a lot of these questions featured in the strategies manual. But I want to surface that because all of this is part of your planning, and this is part of your strategic uh, design of your facilities. And then finally, you're going to want to figure out what your strategies will be. I'm going to walk you through for the next 15 minutes all the different strategies that we want you to think about as you're building your buildings. And again, this is for retrofit as well as new construction. And if anyone has a question, um, we can take them through the presentation as we go through rather than wait at the end. I would welcome questions. And if they take us off topic, uh, we'll, we'll have you, uh, we'll, ha we'll push that to the end. So our strategies manual, as I said, was developed for multifamily housing to understand how to mitigate and adapt to a variety of climate hazards. We're mainly looking at flooding and extreme temperature and some wind. We're not looking at seismic because that's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other uh, 
topic of, uh, of discussion, which we could even do a volume two of the manual on that particular uh, hazard. Uh, but all of these strategies will help you build your facility in a, in a resilient way, uh, and, and there's some real co-benefits to why you would want to build in a resilient way. Uh, you'll be saving operational costs, uh, and which we'll talk about during the adaptation piece. So the strategy manual is broken into four main sections. We focus on strategies that protect your facility from vulnerability to extreme weather. These are your traditional mitigation strategies. We focus on strategies that allow your facility to adapt to extreme and changing weather patterns. We focus on strategies that allow you to back up your facilities, key critical systems. And we focus on strategies that allow you to promote community resilience. And I'm going to walk through each strategy bucket as well as the strategies within. So the first strategy area is protection. Again, this is your classical mitigation. This is your structural fortification and hardening of your facility. Uh, this strategy actually was informed and informed buildings like 334 East 8th Street, which is a Lower East Side former tenement, 30 unit walk up, and they actually were able to model one of these strategies by placing their boiler on the roof, and we'll talk about how they did that in a minute. And as we go, I just want to let everyone know we collect case studies of resilient buildings and resilient interventions, so I welcome everyone to send me their ideas and send me some of the case studies that you've come up with and will be coming up with over the, the years. Um, but all of these strategies that we're going to talk about are grounded in practical application, uh, vetted by multifamily owners, uh, housing owners. So the strategies we feature in this manual we believe are practical to uh, put into place at the multifamily housing level. And I just want to note uh, that the New York Times ran a whole feature on this building a couple weeks ago because it really represents the first kind of building retrofit of its kind in the nation to really retrofit a 100-year-old building and make it more resilient to floods. So we're really proud of this building. And this, uh, this particular project was supported by HUD CDBGDR funding. So protection strategies. The first strategy we we, we focus on is wet flood proofing. And I'm just going to briefly go through each of the particular strategies. We've got 19 strategies. And wet flood proofing is really a strategy that is uh, focused on allowing water to flow through your basement or what's under the base flood elevation. So we've got our base flood ele elevation. These are term checks. Your base flood elevation, which again is the, is the elevation at which water will come into your building. When you build your building in the flood zone, you've got to consider that you have to build above the base flood elevation. So you need typically one to two feet of freeboard, which is the space between the base flood elevation and then what's called the design flood elevation. The design flood elevation is the space at which you are allowed to build, start building your residential systems and residential units. Again, all these terms are in the strategies manual, but these are important to know. When you're talking about wet flood proofing, you want to know that you're engineering your building so that water can flow and infiltrate non-living space underneath the building base flood elevation. This was actually uh, featured in the New York Times as a, uh, a building that uh, sort of na uh, uh, description that uh, kind of really illustrates what this means for a multifamily building. And so what you're going to want to do if you're building a wet flood proofing strategy is you're going to want to make sure everything in the basement is floodable. That means you may have vents, you're going to have your drywall is going to be marine rated, your paint is going to be marine rated. It's literally going to be able to, to run water through your basement. And for many buildings, uh, especially single family, this is a, this is a very uh, viable strategy. Dry flood proofing on the other hand, is a strategy that allows you to essentially uh, wall off your 
basement or what's under the BFE, base flood elevation, and essentially protect the building from any water infiltration. So it's the opposite of wet flood proofing. And what this does is it essentially submarines your basement. It, allow, it, it essentially walls off your basement. So you're going to seal all your cracks. You're going to want to install uh, systems around your boilers and your mechanical that encapsulate the, the, the critical system so that no water can come in. Dry flood proofing has some caveats. In, a new, in an urban environment, dry flood proofing is not looked uh, upon as a viable strategy often because there is a great deal of hydrostatic pressure that builds up when you dry flood proof your facility. And in events like Sandy, what saved many buildings from essentially failing and, and uh, collapsing was the fact that they were able to have water flood through the basement. Uh, because hydrostatic pressure can put a lot of structural pressure on the footings and the and the structural um, supports for the building. So you want to be very careful about this strategy. One way you can approach this is component protection, which we list out in our manual. And this is essentially submarining your critical systems as opposed to the entire building assembly. The next strategy we feature is site perimeter flood proofing. And this is a strategy that uh, assumes that you have some ground to work with. Uh, this is a strategy that allows you to essentially perimeter uh, protect your facility. Um, you can do something as simple as putting sandbags down around your facility, or you could do something a little bit more sophisticated like a flood wall or an inflatable flood wall even. Um, these can be permanent or temporary barriers that you place around your building to protect it from flooding. Uh, it assumes that you have an emergency man management plan in place as well as an operational plan because when you start doing this, you have to talk about egress in and out of the building, and that is something that you need to have in place so that your residents don't get trapped in or out of the building. And then we have a, st a strategy on resilient elevators. Um, elevators are very, very important for larger or even not so large multifamily buildings. Folks can easily get trapped on the top floors if you have an event where your elevator goes down. So it's extremely critical that you think about your elevator systems where you're installing the motors and controllers. They all need to be above the DFE. You want to make sure you have a sump pit, sump pump in the in the pit. You want to reinforce your elevator shafts above the below the design flood elevation because if water comes into your basement, you don't want those systems getting corroded. Uh, there's a lot of challenge in terms of retrofitting a lot of elevators, so we're uh, also supportive of sensors that we talk about in the manual, and we uh, and, and we know in a new construction uh, environment, it's a lot easier to place your motors uh, at the roof. So these are really important and critical, critical infrastructure to consider being resiliently developed and designed. Um, in many municipalities, you have to back up your resilient, your elevator with a, with a separate generator. So uh, I cannot under, underestimate or overstate the importance of having your, your elevators be uh, able to contend with issues like flooding. We also talk about backwater valves. So backwater valves are essentially uh, valves that you place at your your uh, sewage uh, line when it enters the building that uh, prevent backup from occurring in your basement. And so a lot of urban buildings deal with sewage backup uh, at every rain event, even one inch uh, that occurs. And as the levels of the sea are rising and as rivers rise, we also know that the water tables rise as well. So we are seeing a lot more sewage backup in buildings in the New York City uh, environs. So backflow preventers are really key to help keeping that sewage water out. It also assumes that you have a, an emergency manual too because when you have a backwater valve, you cannot flush your toilets. You also want to make sure that you're connecting your roof drains uh, to your system in a way that the roof drains are not going to end up flooding your building during a storm event. 
So backwater valves are really kind of an affordable uh, way to help deal with water infiltration occurring at your building level. Uh, the next strategy we like to talk to you about is the sump pumps. So sump pumps are, you can have temporary sump pumps, you get permanent sump pumps. Uh, it's a rather cost-effective mechanism to get water out of your building quickly. Uh, if there's a rain event and water floods your building, you'll be pumping your water out. Uh, you'll wait for the water to subside if you can't do a, cir a circuitous pump, but these are uh, really important systems to have in place in your basements so that you can get water out. Um, again, the sump pump uh, should be installed at low points in the basement floor to collect all the water. Uh, you have to figure out how much water you may be anticipating. So when you do your design uh, and risk, mitigate, risk uh, assessment, you're going to want to know what your particular rainfall predictions are. Um, you're going to want to size your pump accordingly. So the next area we look at is adaptation, strategies that improve a facility's ability to adapt to changing climate. And these strategies have particular co-benefits with regard to your operational costs and making sure that you can draw down some of your utility costs. So a lot of these strategies relate to energy efficiency and water efficiency. So the first thing you want to look at in terms of understanding your adaptive ability of the building is your ability to withstand changing temperature. And envelope, your, your building's envelope is the critical the critical connected system that you need to have in place to make sure that your building is able to uh, protect itself from the changing conditions, uh, extreme heat, extreme cooling. Uh, envelope, most buildings are not designed to remain habitable during extended power loss. So heat loss through the building envelope determines how quickly interior temperatures will rise and fall. Um, and so a high performance envelope is especially valuable because what it allows you to do is really increase your building's passive survivability. So if you are familiar with passive house, you'll know that uh, in a passive house assembly, there's less reliance on a larger boiler system uh, to heat the building because the building can retain heat a lot more efficiently than a traditional building that has not been built to this standard. And the same thing with, with extreme cool. So you'll be able to retain heat and also vent your building out and retain uh, and retain its uh, stasis so that you, you're able to uh, deal with changing and fluctuating uh, conditions. And so what you might want to first do when you're looking at your envelope efficiency is conduct an envelope performance audit, and you want to ask an energy auditor to help you find uh, areas which should be air sealed or insulated. If it's a new building that you're constructing, you have a lot of opportunity to figure out uh, how to build it in a way that's going to be able to optimize your envelope efficiency. This is the critical piece because a lot of our buildings, especially in our cities, depend so critically on the grid that if the grid were to go down, these buildings would be uninhabitable. So this is important. Again, elevating your equipment, as we talked about on the East 8th Street property, uh, moving the equipment from the base fill at elevation to the roof has a lot of co-benefits. You'll be saving uh, on your electrical uh, costs, and you'll also be able to ensure that your equipment will be able to sustain a flood event. And for a retrofit, this could be more challenging uh, in terms of getting the piping set up, getting everything moved, uh, making sure the roof can maintain the uh, structural weight of the systems, making sure you have housing in place on the roof. But you'll know that you are fully able to withstand a flood event if you move it. And for new construction, it's always good if you're 
siting in the floodplain to move your equipment uh, at the outset on the roof, or at least above the BFE. Uh, and then, of course, elevating your living space above the BFE, uh, repurposing the basement or the cellar or whatever's under the base flood elevation so that you can ensure that your residential units are able to withstand any kind of flood event. Uh, we also support surface stormwater management. So again, if you have space around your facility, you're going to want to think about ways of incorporating stormwater management. Uh, this could be connected very closely to the strategy on perimeter flood proofing, because if you have stormwater management systems in place, uh, you might also want to think about how that coincides with your perimeter flood proofing. Uh, your perimeter flood proofing could be some permanent berms that also incorporate stormwater management in them. So the idea of st surface stormwater management is managing the stormwater that falls on your site. Window shading is an important strategy to think about how to cool your building during the extreme heat, heat uh, intervals. And this is a passive way to keep your building cool, keep your units cool. It saves uh, the operational costs of high electrical bills. And it's a rather affordable way of shading your building and keeping it uh, at, at a moderate temperature during those extreme moments. And distributed heating and cooling is another way that you can actually uh, achieve energy efficiency as well as achieve the goal of moving your critical MEP systems out of the basement. So instead of moving them to the roof, you can think about moving uh, to a distributed heating and cooling environment where you're decentralizing your heating and cooling and installing high efficiency units into your uh, cooling and heating units into your, into your units. Uh, so this gives the residents more control over their temperature, and it also uh, creates less of a burden on a centralized heating and cooling system. And we go into some very specific detail about looking at VRF units or looking at different uh, distribution strategies uh, that will allow you to achieve this. And in every single strategy, we talk about our operations and maintenance triggers uh, and how you put the strategy into action. So you'll go to our, our manual and you'll see that uh, we recommend some next steps on every strategy. Uh, the backup, the backup strategy. So these are strategies that provide a critical backup should the grid fail. Um, and these are critical because we know from experience in cities like New York and LA that the grid does fail. And you need to be able to support your residents uh, should that happen. So the first strategy, of course, is backup power. Um, this is really important when you have when you have vulnerable residents on site. Um, every building should have a backup power source should the grid fail. Uh, so what what we go into detail on this is what are your critical loads? So first thing you want to think about is what do you need to power, have powered up should there be a grid outage? Um, do you have vulnerable residents that need to have medical equipment? Do you have a sump pump that needs to be powered up should there be a failure? Do you have refrigeration needs? What are your lighting needs? What are the critical loads that you have to have in place that you need to size your generator to? Now, many of you may be asking, should I be sizing my generator to the units? And the response is, that's a pretty heavy lift. If you're sizing your generator to all of your units, you've got to then predict what your units and what your tenants are going to be using, and that could quickly become untenable. So you want to look at critical load. And then you're going to want to look at what are the, uh, you know, will this be an automatic a system that comes on automatically, am I going to have an automatic transfer switch in place? Will it be a manual transfer switch? How do you operate the system? How do you exercise it? What kind of fuel do you need to have in place? Is it going to be a propane or a gas generator? Uh, and then where do you place the generator? And this is a case of placing the generator on the roof, but uh, if you have some backyard space, you can, you can raise the generator on a pad. 
Um, so there's a lot of different ways of, of designing your generator. Emergency lighting is critical to making sure that your building has enough lighting to get people in and out of the building. Uh, you can look at some really beautiful LED lighting uh, systems that are in place now because traditionally uh, a lot of lighting was just uh, was not LED, so there was it only lasted for a couple hours. LEDs can last quite a quite a long time, and you can also connect battery packs to the emergency lighting systems so that you can have ongoing lighting. And this is particularly important if you have residents that are likely to shelter in place. Uh, potable water, access to potable water. So there's a lot of, uh, in our green, Enterprise Green Communities criteria, we've got a whole design for resilience criteria section, and one of the, one of the credits that you get are to have potable water on site that's a backup to the water utility should that fail. So we have a whole strategy on accessing potable water, and this may be something as simple as getting a water delivery to deliver water to you and keep it on site uh, should there be an event, and keeping you know a couple gallons per person on site uh, should, you, should you need to. And it's worth noting in many flood vulnerable areas, you may have a lot of water flooding into your building, but that's not potable water and your water supply may get contaminated should there be a big event, rain event or flood event. So having potable water is, a, is important to have if you have vulnerable residents. Don't always assume that, that, that the water coming into your building is going to be potable. You have to make sure that that's the case. Um, there was an event in West Virginia a couple years ago where the water supply was contaminated by a chemical spill. And so residents at buildings around the area had to get potable water, and that's not easy to get after the fact. And then finally, we have strategies that promote community building and community ties that encourage behavior change. So the first, first strategy is, do you have a place for your residents in a multifamily building to gather? Uh, do you have a community room that you can turn into a resilience room? where you can have backup power to it and potable water and some, some uh, activities and some storage areas and some way to bring residents together if there were to be a disaster. If you don't have one at your facility, perhaps there's one in the community that you can have on hand to make sure that you have that access. The other idea is if you have community rooms at your facilities, that you have programming that happens. Let's say you have a senior facility. Any kind of programming you do to promote community connectivity promotes community resilience. It promotes neighbors getting to know neighbors, which is always helpful if there's a big event. And so we, we recommend that you think about having a place that you can create community connectivity. It may not be a room. It could be a bulletin board. But some place to bring residents together, as we know, in today's day and age, a lot of folks are relying on the social media channels to create community, and that does not always uh, help in a localized event. We ask you all to develop an emergency management manual. It can be as simple as a five-page list of your vendors and your residents that are vulnerable uh, to your first responder numbers or as sophisticated as having a, an incident command system chart of all of your staffing leads for particular areas of need at your building. We provide you with both. We have a very sophisticated tool we developed that's compendium to this uh, manual that can help you guide through emergency management planning. Uh, actually, if you're going through Enterprise Green Communities Criteria compliance, it's mandatory that you have an emergency manu manu manual on site. So uh, this is a tool that we can help you develop that, but this is a compliance for enterprise green communities. And then finally, organizing for community resilience, which is essentially making sure you know who your community neighbors are, you know what social services there are in the community, you know who your first responders are, because you're connected to a larger community. 
it's important to know who you are within that context. So finally, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about a tool that we've developed that will help you understand what you need to do at the building level to develop resilient strategies. So we've just gone through all of the strategies that we've got in place uh, that we're proposing that will help you build your resilience. Uh, but the question that you might be asking is, okay, that's great. I have a lot of strategies that I can think about. How do I actually identify what strategies are appropriate for my building? We've solved that problem. We built out a resilience capital needs assessment tool that will help building owners understand how to apply the strategies we just mentioned to your building. There is an intensive capital needs assessment tool uh, that really gets deeply into the buildings and, and, and how, they, how, how you would want to retrofit the building to become more resilient. And there's a shorter version. Uh, but this is important because as you're thinking about your building planning, you're thinking about your capital needs assessment, and you're thinking about how do you structure the actual resiliency assessment of the building. So this building tool is a really critical next step in the gener sort of first generation resilience build outs uh, that help you understand how to, how to actually go forward. And in terms of who builds out this tool and who actually uh, is able to actually conduct the assessment, uh, this would be applicable for auditors, for uh, designers, for engineers, for building science folks. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a new kind of market that's just opening up, but uh, I think that certainly in communities that deal with repeated laws and deal with uh, flooding and other extreme events, uh, this will become much more part of our capital planning as we go forward. And all of the tools that I mentioned, which include the strategies manual and our disaster staffing toolkit, plus we have about 90 videos on how you deal with repair and recovery and resilience building, and we have a survey that you can take to identify whether you're ready to respond. All of these are available for you on the uh, website I've mentioned. Okay, so I'm gonna now open up to questions. Hey everybody, yeah, let's uh, get some questions in now. Uh, Lori, thanks for the presentation. And as those questions are rolling in, just real quick, uh, for those of you needing your continuing education, uh, check your email, check your spam for the details on how to report. Uh, please take the survey at the end of this session. Um, you're going to be able to self-report your GBCI and we will report the AIA. Uh, for those of you watching on demand, the recording in the future, please take the 10 question quiz with an 80% pass rate. Um, and as uh, the questions are coming in here, a real quick thanks to uh, all of our supporters, uh, Niagara Conservation, Panasonic Ventilation, uh, Certainty Air Renew, uh, the CERV by Build Equinox, Sun Intuitive Glass, our members, sponsors, um, board of directors, uh, we certainly could not do it without you. Um, so, Larry, I still see some, uh, I think some questions are coming in, but I, I did have one that um, popped up in my mind when you were uh, bringing up the idea of uh, moving uh, HVAC and moving equipment and starting to take up uh, roof space for that, and I, um, you know, I, I, I am seeing as far as high performance multifamily projects go, um, we're definitely involved in some of these. The concept is, you know, getting everything off of the roof, ideally getting it into geothermal, burying it under the ground, using the heating and cooling technology of the ground, and then placing solar uh, on top of the roof. So, is there, um, uh, I guess, a um, are there two uh, dueling uh, concepts here of, of you know, moving in the direction of high performance buildings and resiliency, or, or are there ways to, uh, to reconcile these? That is an excellent question, Brett. I, uh, I would offer this. 
there's no reason why we can't pitch solar PV or even thermal on the roof alongside the MEP systems. Can we can we mount them in a way that they can be that they can work in a complementary fashion? Um, because you've got to get to a 38-degree pitch. So can you mount it uh, above the MEP systems? I mean, there's going to be housing for the MEP systems. So you, I wonder if you can mount that on the housing. Um, there could be problems in terms of egress in and out of the housing, the MEP sort of uh, operating the MEP systems. Uh, so that could be one thing that needs to be dealt with. Uh, I think this is the question that we face in the world of laying down green roofs and how they interact with solar. So I think that we we need to figure out a way to, um, I think, mean, design a roof assembly that can uh, allow for all of these systems to operate uh, in conjunction. But I think at some point, you have to think about what your priorities are for your particular site. And if you're in a floodplain community that that is exposed to repeated loss, and you're facing a hundred, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in losses every couple of years as floods uh, flood risk grows, you may want to think I'm going to prioritize putting my MEP systems on the roof and putting my solar, you know, mounted on the walls or mounted mounted above. Um, there's another area you can put your MEP systems. You can certainly put them on the first floor above the BFE. You just have to figure out the kind of MEP systems that work for you. I've seen a couple condensing units placed on the first floors of a couple facilities, and they work beautifully. So there's no reason you can't find space on your first floor as well. And then you can have your solar on top of the roof. All right, great. Yeah, and um, hey, everybody, we, we do have some time for questions if you have them. Um, I wanted to follow up on the geothermal side. Do you know if, if geothermal systems in general are, uh, are a risk to flooding because of where they're located? You know, that's a good question. Have you, I'm, it would be a good question to f f find out if there's a case of a geothermal assembly occurring in a floodplain community. I mean, one of the things that comes up for me is the risk of water uh, damaging the geothermal system. Uh, the, you have to flood proof the, the penetration for the geothermal system, right? I mean, it, and so you have to make sure all of that is flood proofed. Um, so the shaft down, all of that has to be flood proofed. Um, I mean, the maritime industry, I mean, geothermal can certainly coincide, coexist with, with, uh, with a resilient upgrade for sure. Uh, it's just a question of um, how many geothermal assemblies work for a lot of the building owners out there. They're very expensive. So I think that, you know, that's one thing to consider. Great. Well, no, well, thank you for, uh, um, for going over there. Well, Lori, I, uh, I think you did such a great job presenting that um, everybody uh, <laughs> knows what to do next. I, I didn't see any questions here. I know it's a, at least where I'm at a beautiful day. Um, we are at our time for one o'clock now, but uh, Lori, if people do have questions and want to get more resources, um, where can they contact you? Where can they get uh, more resources? Well, they can come over to uh, contact me at Enterprise. Uh, I would invite everyone to download the, the information and, uh, and, again, share with us your story and what you're doing, and uh, we'd love to track what you're, what you're working on. All right, great. Well, thanks, uh, Lori. Thanks for the Enterprise Community Partners. Um, everybody uh, enjoy the uh, summer that's on its way. Take care. Thank you so much, Brett. Bye, everyone.